Hey, Cynthia Allen here. I'm live from Elisa's Kitchen and going to see if I can help you out with how you can do some holiday marathon cooking without hurting your back. This is actually something that pretty commonly people tell me starts to improve for them when they start working with me and um, I think it's definitely doable, definitely doable. And the first thing I really actually want to talk about is how we stand in the kitchen or how we stand anywhere for any length of time. So standing is something that people have a lot of different strategies for once they stand for more than a few minutes. And it's important to know what your strategy is because that's probably a big key to why you're starting to get into trouble. Now, I'm going to just do some variations, but there's actually way more variations of this, but I'll do a few variations. So one, one strategy, and I'll show you my own personal favorite, is to push forward in the butt and to actually hang on my sacrum. I don't know if you can tell that, but the way that I do that actually locks out my SI joint here, and then the weight of my body starts to hang down and forward into my thighs. Now, this is not going to go well. It doesn't go well for me for very long at all. If I don't pay attention to this and start to say to myself, Hey, Cynthia, what are you doing with your pelvis? And where's the weight on your feet? And you can try some of these things, by the way. If you stand up and try them while we're going along, you might discover some really cool things about yourself. Where's the weight on the feet? Oh, there's my weight. It's way forward onto the balls. My heels are hardly connecting. My pelvis is forward. I can feel the weight of my body hanging down into here. So just being willing to start to play with pulling my pelvis a little bit forward and back in my case can make a big difference. Now, that's my strategy. Some people's strategy, I don't know if you'll be able to see this on the video or not, but it is to lock their knees back, okay? So they will lock their knees back. Now typically when someone locks their knees back, that also locks their low back into a really deep in curve. And now what's happening is not hanging off the sacrum, but the weight of your trunk is now hanging into your low back, right behind your waist as well as into the knee joints themselves. For a few minutes you might think, hey, you know, I didn't notice anything, things feel you know, fine. It's when you start to do this for long periods of time that you really will notice it. It's actually a problem if this is your strategy all the time. It's one you want to learn to uh, play around with. But uh, getting to know what you do is one of the really big things uh, in the kitchen or anywhere standing in line and really then beginning to unravel some of the components. Uh, another one that some people do is they, they, they feel like they want to be in this kind of position so now they're hanging off of their chest and their tail would tuck under a little bit. And over time, they're, they're going to feel weak. They'll say, I feel really exhausted. I feel tired through here. And they might also feel like the back is a little bit strained. And they're particularly going to feel like the back is a little bit strained when they go to lean over and take things in and out of the dishwasher. So we're going to take a little look at that too. Now, so what to do about the standing part. Uh, there's several things that we could do to work with uh, our standing posture. And one is that we could adopt a little bit of width and a little bit of sinking down into the knees and the pelvis. And I really would refer to this as a little bit more of a martial arts way of standing. You've probably seen those beautiful, right, Tai Chi motions and they're, they have this really beautiful glide and their knees are always soft. Well, what happens when you have a little bit of softness in the knees, you have a little bit of width between your feet, you can't see my feet but I widened my stance, and then you just let things sink down a little bit, is your arches of your feet will typically activate, okay? So if you found your knees collapsing in, that's not what we're looking for. But when, if your arches of your feet activate a little bit, and you'll feel your tail drop a bit, and this will require a little bit more quad strength, uh, than you might be used to. 
but it's not a, a squat, it's just a tiny little hint, a tiny little hint of um, feeling what's the possibility of just lowering your, your center of gravity like a, a nano amount, a nano amount. And that can start to let your back free up. You saw when I was locking my knees how the low back will lock into this forward position and will soften the knees, will help. Now, if you have a really narrow base of support we're working, because I know I do sometimes will get really narrow while I'm in the kitchen and start to do funny little twisting motions here. Well, that's going to uh, make it a little bit more challenging to get the benefit of these softer knees. So a little bit wider stance, letting yourself try to drop down so that you start to feel that your body weight is actually sitting on your legs and your feet. It's not hanging somewhere in your spine. Really, really significant, not hanging somewhere in your spine. Now, just another thing that you could do periodically that you check in with yourself, change your standing position, is just once in a while do an easy shoulder roll up and back and then let it hang. An easy shoulder roll up and back and let it hang. You notice that what I didn't do was a big forceful one. Okay, so I'm not really, I'm kind of more along the Feldenkrais line where we do things a little bit more small, gentle, it's all an invitation and not uh, trying to overpower yourself, not trying to overpower yourself. So someone sent in a question yesterday, this is Beth who sent in a question, how can I support my back while working in the kitchen? I tend to lean my pelvis against the counter and just kind of hang out there when I'm there for more than a few minutes. But I'm wondering about, again, just lowering your base of support a little bit, widening your feet, and just really then walking yourself in a little bit. I think it's going to be a little less likely that you'll lean in if you widen your base of support. It's not quite as much fun. But also, I have to say, it feels different on my back than if I have a really narrow base of support. So even if you do end up leaning in once in a while, that might be helpful for you. Also, just think about what ways could you, once in a while, every few moments, by, you know, like maybe 10, 15 minutes, take a little tiny movement break. And one thing that you might be able to do is to put your hand, nudge it up like your fist on your sacrum, and your hand on your chest. And actually do a little teeter-totter where you lift the hand on the chest, which actually lifts the chest. You notice I'm not sliding. And I'm really connecting to the bony areas here. And then on the hand on the sacrum is literally pushing the bone and the sacrum down. So that can give you just a little sense of uh, uprightness, a new sense of what can happen there in the back, uh, both the upper and the lower. And then you come back to uh, whatever it is that you're doing. Okay. Kathy says, my challenge is around prolonged standing, especially while hand washing dishes. Lately I've been getting a tightness and overuse in the lower back and joints and just feel irritated from the tension. Also happens when standing at my computer while doing work. So standing is a phenomenal piece of human function, but we're really more meant to be moving. And so oftentimes when people are at a standing desk or a cash register, right, the first standing desk were these cash registers, uh, and nobody thought to themselves, hey, I want to be a cash register. Uh, I want to work at the cash register and stand all day, right? You didn't think that. So I know it's kind of odd that we all went to this wildness about a standing desk, but up and down movement, that's the most important thing that you can possibly do. So while doing dishes, or anything where you're really standing still, I think there's several things to think about. One is, if you're going to be standing on surfaces for a long period of time, while well, I'm a fan of people being barefoot, I think that they actually will probably do a little bit better with a supportive shoe. I'm talking about for hours. 
So if it's a half an hour, an hour, but if you're going to be cooking all day long in these one of these marathon deals where you're getting ready for your family, I would really consider uh, what shoes you have on. And maybe you could change out some shoes, no shoes, some variety. I do think those anti-fatigue mats could help some people, but they're not an end-all be-all. But one thing I really, really like to do to break up that tension, Kathy, is I like to walk in place, toe heel. And I'm sorry that I don't have the ability to scan all the way down here for you. But literally, I put my toe down and then my heel. And every time my heel comes, I let the pelvis drop a little bit. Toe heel, toe heel, toe heel. This has been a big saver for me, boy, in the lines. We just went to uh, England and stood in all those incredible lines for the palace and uh, Windsor Castle. And just the ability to do a little bit of walking in place. It's sort of like beginning to moonwalk, but I don't, you know, you don't moonwalk, you stay in place. And um, that could really make, I think, a big difference for you while doing dishes. Also make a big difference for you, because I know you like to dance, is to do some dancing while you're doing dishes. So put on some music that you really like and actually get some movement in there while you're washing dishes. So hopefully that might help you a little bit too. Okay, so let's take a look at... Um, a couple of other little pieces that might be helpful. So something that people do an awful lot of in the kitchen, right, is load and unload dishwashers, get in and out of cabinets. And I think that's uh, actually really an important piece is feeling what's the, what's the way in which you bend over. So I'm already feeling here, even as I'm taking the door open and closed, I'm feeling the process of being able to make a bit of a squat. So even if you're not going to do uh, full squats, you need to have in your repertoire enough of a squat that you can do things like get in and out of the dish, you know, open the dishwasher and be able to feel like as you fold down, the weight on your feet stays really well distributed front to back. The hip joints slide back and there's a quality of a teeter-totter here where the pelvis is going back in space and, and a little bit up as the head comes down. And then the dishes, same thing. What happens is whatever habit we have in life in, in general, so maybe I'm somebody who normally does this. Boy, suddenly I'm, I'm doing that more. I'm getting ready to do dishes and I'm probably doing them fast because I'm thinking about trying to get that kitchen cleaned up or whatever's going on. But we really want to be cautious about these moments of turning, loading, lifting, even, small, even plates. I mean, it's an amazing thing how many people can say they hurt themselves taking a plate or a glass out of the cabinet and usually to go with it was a twist. So dropping, folding, keeping a long spine, taking those dishes, putting them in, if you're bringing them out to put on the counter. Um, even that bit of unfolding, there should be a bit of a spring from the feet. Not, it's not haul yourself up from the back each time, which would look really different. So some people do kind of hauling themselves up from the lower back, or they'll haul themselves up from the chest each time, or they'll haul themselves up from the neck each time. Be, see if you can find the quality of pressing through your feet, uh, even in that small amount of coming up. Just adding a little hint of that will make a really big difference for you. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for so loaning me your kitchen. I appreciate it. And so Brian uh, wrote in and asked, said he was challenged with cutting sweet potatoes. 
I, you know, I wasn't actually expecting this question, was I was thinking more, you know, back-related items, but you could possibly hurt your back, I suppose, getting kind of sweet potato. I'm not sure now. I actually know Brian, and Brian makes this incredible sweet potato and kale soup with beans, and it's really, really good, and he cuts a ton of sweet potatoes. What do you think? You ever find sweet potatoes challenging? They are. The big fat part's the hardest part. Big fat part. Okay. Well, let's see. So what? I don't know. What do you do? I. I first of all, I don't like to peel them. I'm like you. I think you said you don't like to peel them. I don't I like to peel them either. So if all possible, I'm not going to peel a sweet potato, because that takes a lot of extra time. Um, but I would, I would cut it in half lengthwise. What would you do? I actually think, I was just thinking about that. I, would, I think I would cut it in half the other way. Because I think when you get lengthwise, you have two such different widths uh -huh. that it gets trickier. I struggle more to cut lengthwise than to cut this wise. Huh. Okay. Now, if you need it cut lengthwise, then no, you got to figure that out too. If you're, if you're, you're gonna, just, if you're just chopping, go ahead and cut off the end there so we can see. So, okay. So, uh, would Elise... Um, Elise showed is she cut from the middle, and she didn't really use much of a lever action, which is pretty typical because most of us don't take uh, classes on cooking. You know, when you watch all these uh, uh, shows on cooking, I'm like shocked at how much they have learned to use their knives and their material incredibly well. But you might think, Brian, about the lever action of your knife, so that might be one thing. And it um, looks like she's ready to then turn around and go along one slice. Mm -hmm. One more, would you stack them? Eh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I might do a little bit of both. Yeah. I don't know. I'm thinking I'm how much prefer I I think I would do like flies. And I'm trying to use my body weight a little bit so it's not just, um, it's not just um, my hands. So I'm trying to use a little bit of my body weight. But now, this is what Elise was hoping to avoid, is now I have to try to get into a little bit extra, a little funky, and then I would turn them and cut this way. Yeah, that's different. I think using the other hand, too, that okay. gives a little bit of support and yeah. uh, a little bit more of the liver. Yeah. All right, Brian, we need your recipe. We've got some sweet potatoes here. In this year, but... Well, so we, last weekend, made three big batches of sugar cookies. Wow. That's work. That is work. What are your tips for not running out of steam by the third batch of rolling to get them flat, to cut them out? Oh, yeah. We have an exchange student. It was her first time making um, sugar cookies. Rolling cookies was not her favorite. After that, I thought for sure she was never going to make sugar cookies again. Yeah. Um, well, the, I mean, the first thing is, is that when I go back to say that cooking is actually a, an, a bit of an athletic event, it depends. You're going to need to be in somewhat of good shape to cook those long marathons like that. And I know you are, so I mean, you're an athletic gal. And you're, but, but still, what happens is we start to get fatigued from doing the same thing repetitively and um, standing in one place. So uh, besides the tips that I've given already, there's a little something that people t that uh, people have voluntarily told me that they use from Bones for Life, which you might remember. I don't know if I've ever taught you this or not, but it's actually bouncing on heels. So you have a little double tap in your heels, and we say the vocalization pum pum. Okay, so you want to like drop your hands, and we would we. If she's in a, a little bit of a heel, so they go that way. A, a, a boot, so that's not the ideal thing. But it would go pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum. So now I've had people tell me that they're singing in choirs for several hours at a time. I had a veterinarian who does this actually while doing surgeries. Uh, so, you know, uses this as a way on concrete floors to relieve her sense of stress. It bump, bumps up the energy a little bit and it just reorders everything. So I think that's one thing that you can do. I also think actually making sure that you, at your most downtime, you have some really fun music on that makes you want to move a little bit. So maybe that's not how you start out, but at the most downtime, putting on some music that makes you feel like you want to, you know, 
move a bit. I know um, several years ago I got to go to the music museum in, I don't think they call it music museum in um, Phoenix, Arizona. And that was the most fascinating museum because you know how many of us go into museums and we get fatigued and tired and our back or our hip or something hurts. And I was in there for several hours and nothing ever hurt. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I think it's because every exhibit encouraged you to move. Mm -hmm. And people, even people who weren't movers, were moving. You could see them coming up, and mm -hmm. maybe they were just a little, but they were still like moving a little to the rhythms and the beats of what was going on in each exhibit. So, mm -hmm. having a little bit of bit of a wobble there can help a lot. So, all right. So too okay. bad we didn't talk to you before last Friday. <laughs> okay. We did have a little Christmas music. Thank on. you, dear. I'm Thank gonna you. finish up, and I'll put you let you step off the spotlight. All right. Everybody probably has a towel um, in their kitchen, and uh, you've seen in yoga, you know, this thing where you bring your hands behind, you try to touch your hands behind your back. Well, in Ruthie Alon's um, Bones for Life Movement Intelligence work, she has an adaptation of that that I think is really worth um, having, and it would just use as a common everyday towel, and you bring the hand above your head as far as it's easy for you to come behind your head and without having to really lean way forward. So for you that's here, fine. If it's here, if it's here. And some people, if you've been doing uh, yoga for a lot of years, you might be able to put your hand much further behind your head than me. It's not, not a competition in that way. And the other hand would be down here on your sacrum. Now already, if you were tending to be rounded forward, this already started to open up your chest a little bit. And now you're going to take the hand that's below and on your sacrum, and you're going to pull it down. And you're going to pull it down and spiral it in a little bit. Now that means you're passively uh, pulling a little bit on the upper arm. I'm not trying to push the arm down, I'm pulling it lightly down. Just lightly down. And then you would stop after you've done a few of those, just maybe a handful, you'll feel the difference, right? You could switch to the other side. And then the opposite of, of this that you can do, which will be handy for some people, is to pull up. So you pull up, and this means you're pulling the bottom hand now up a little bit. Now one thing that you, I hope, can see is that I'm keeping my back pretty, my, especially my low back, I'm keeping it quite neutral while I'm doing this. So I'm not pulling down and then arching my back a bunch, and I'm not pulling up and arching my back. I'm trying to keep some attention on keeping my back neutral. And one of the problems, of course, is we start to get fatigued we start to get fatigued, and then we're, uh, you know, we're either rounding here, or again, for some of us, we're like hanging off that low back, and oh, we're like, oh, it hurts, it hurts. Or maybe your thing is you hang off of a hip, okay? You can tell which hip I would hang off of, but and maybe you hang off of a hip, and then after a while, you're like, man, that's starting to get tired. The last thing I think is really important is, even though you can't control everything about your counter height, usually people at least have a table or a cart, and so you might be able to move some things back and forth, the jobs back and forth to the right, uh, a better height for you. Uh, I hope those are helpful hints for you, um, and I'm really appreciative of you tuning in, and we'll see where else we can go with uh, trying out a little bit of uh, freedom in standing and uh, lines in your standing desk at work. You're, you're somebody who does uh, a really repetitive standing job as well as just good old-fashioned holiday cooking. Okay, bye-bye.